much, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start my talk today with a bit of audience participation. How many people here drive an electric car? We nearly had one hand. We have one hand. So out of, out of an audience of 100 or 150, we have 1%, which compares pretty well to 0.004% of the UK's car fleet. Now, for those of you who didn't put up your hands, how many of you would buy an electric car as your next vehicle, assuming you could afford one? So we're looking at about 30% of the audience, which is not bad, because research suggests that 20% of the public today would look to buy an electric car. Now, just remember those figures for the rest of the presentation. And I'm going to take you back now three or four years to a time where this was the future of electric cars. This is the G-Wiz. And it was the only electric car you could buy on the market at this time. It had a range of about 50 miles, and it could go about 50 miles an hour maximum. So you can understand why many people weren't particularly enthused with the future of electric vehicles, because most people rightly would think that is not a car I would like to be seen dead in. It was doing a good job, though. I mean, it was introducing the public to electric cars. But had I shown you that this was the future of electric cars, or more like the future of electric cars, sexy, fast, and interesting, more people may have been interested in this future. So while I was at university, I decided that something needed to be done to change what people thought about electric cars and electric vehicle technology. So I put together a team of highly talented engineers, all from Imperial College here in London, and we set about scheming as to a project that we could design, we could develop, to really change the way people thought about this technology. And so we came up with these three maxims, these three things which this project had to encapsulate. First of all, it had to be a really exciting adventure, something that people would say, wow, I have to understand more. I have to learn more about what these crazy guys are up to. Secondly, we had to change the public perception of electric vehicles. Without that, the project would be dead in the water. It had to achieve that basic thing, which is not that basic to achieve. And thirdly, and most importantly to me, I wanted to inspire education in younger children. We do not have enough kids in our, in our economy today coming through as engineers, scientists, and technologists to face the challenges we will face as, as a society in the future. So with this project, our team wanted to inspire kids to take up these subjects. So after a lot of thinking, we came up with this. This is the Pan American Highway. It's the longest road in the world, stretching 26,000 kilometers from Alaska to Argentina. Now, that map doesn't really do it justice. If I could have the globe, please. What this really means is starting at the Arctic Circle, all the way up there, and traveling 26,000 kilometers through 14 countries down to the southernmost city in the world, in Ushuaia. That's a long way. You're covering about half the Earth's curvature from north to south, and about a quarter of it from west to east. So it's a serious, serious journey. So, moving on. This team of dedicated engineers that I spoke about so favorably earlier, they started building a car, an electric car, that we could drive down this road to shatter these public perceptions. We wanted it to have an extremely long range and be really exciting to drive. So that, mean, it, that meant it needed a large battery pack. In fact, the largest road-going battery pack in any electric car to date. That's 54 kilowatt hours of energy, enabling the car to go over 500 kilometers per charge at a top speed of over 100 miles an hour a naught to acceleration of naught to 60 miles an hour in just six seconds. So really impressive performance. By March 2010, we were able to get this car onto a dynamometer or effectively a treadmill for a car where we could test it using real drive cycle data. And of course, it wasn't quite so plain sailing as you can see our shock of horror here when our pre-charge circuit exploded. But by April 2010, we had the car road legalized and on the road, and we got a true feel for what it was like to drive this incredible car. Just imagine sitting there, no windscreen, no roof, really feeling the wind rush past your face without any uh, noise from the back. 400 horsepower in the rear of that car. And in May 2010, we started setting records. We became the first electric car to circumnavigate the M25 twice on a single charge, and then the first electric car to go from London to Paris, which is over 290 miles on a single charge. 
And by this time, we thought the car was ready to take it on this fantastic journey. And so we flew it out to Alaska. And this is one of our first days, beginning of July, in the remote wilderness of northern Alaska. And as you can get a feel, you're just surrounded by these massive mountains, huge expanses of forest, and nothing, and I mean nothing, for hundreds of miles around. And this is where the long range really came into play, because if we didn't have a range that long, we would run out of battery power in the middle of nowhere and have some serious problems. So we continued down through the United States, Canada, West Coast, California, and we hit Route 66, the famous Route 66 on the way to Las Vegas, where we spent a very enjoyable evening. And powering our way across the United States, we'd done 8,000 kilometers, and we were feeling so confident with ourselves. The food was great, the people were great, everybody spoke English. We were really confident that we would finish in Ushuaia, uh, not so long later. But then we hit Mexico, and boy, did we hit it hard. Immediately, this is just five minutes into the country, so pretty much immediately, we were stopped by three police cars. Now, being stopped by police is not anything new to us. We had been stopped 46 times during the whole duration of this trip, so it wasn't anything new. But what was new is the place where we were stopped. This is northern Mexico. This is bandit country. More murders here per year than Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And we were warned by the British Foreign Office, our sponsors, the Mexican government, just about anybody that cared to give us advice. Don't even go there. Just drive as fast as you can through there if you're going to drive at all. So we were eager to carry on down the road. And carry on down the road, we did. Now, the word road is used quite loosely, especially in South America. In some places, the climate is just so severe that overnight, it washes away the road. Fortunately, on this occasion, there was at least tarmac on one side, so the car could pass relatively unhindered. But bear in mind, for the next picture, we only have a ground clearance of just three inches. And in Ecuador, the road just disappears onto a sandy track with rocks strewn around everywhere. And so it's quite a challenge to dodge some of these larger rocks that you can see here. And when you do hit them, and inevitably you do, it really hurts the car. But we managed to navigate them, and we also managed to navigate these massive lorries, which are just bombing past without any care to any form of road conduct or rule of the highway. But nonetheless, we managed to not crash into any one of those. But we did crash, as you would expect. With a journey this long, the statistics are very high, except we didn't crash on the road. We crashed at a demonstration at a university. So you may think this is an absolute disaster. We thought it was an absolute disaster. We've got our pride and joy, our baby that we'd spent months building, years nurturing, and there it is crashed into a wall. But it actually turned out to be a pretty good thing because the six of us, the team, pulled together so strongly that we managed to fix that car in just six days. And the other positive outcome is that we were surrounded by hundreds of people with cameras and video cameras. And instead of that being negative media, and everybody saying, oh, this car can't drive, or these people can't drive, or it's a waste of time, everybody was suddenly so concerned and so interested in the project that suddenly there was this fancy car that crashed in Ecuador that this news of this project spread like wildfire throughout the South American continent. And we had people calling us up from Argentina and Chile and Peru saying, guys, are you going to make it to our press events? Are you going to make it to the finish line? Will you be able to succeed? And we told them, yes, we would. And we fixed the car and we continued again down the road. This time, the road was a lot nicer. We're passing through the Atacama Desert, which is the longest desert in the world, a stretch of 3,000 kilometers through Peru and northern Chile. And here, the climate is just dry and hot the whole year round, and so the road conditions are absolutely perfect. We powered our way down through Chile, crossed the Andes Mountains, which is the second highest mountain range in the world, crossed into Argentina, and after about another 8,000 kilometers, we reached the end. That's it. This is the end of the South American continent. But there's still one more step to go. We have to take this ferry across the Magellan Straits into Tierra del Fuego. Now, this is the, one of the most southern islands in the world, apart from the islands surrounding Antarctica. And it is one of these famed places where you, know, you, you hear about the land of fire, but you don't really know that much about. But when you're on the island, you're just surrounded by true, true wilderness, where man has a very, very limited footprint. And in this area, the only footprint they have is this small fence you can see in this gravel road. And with the, again, with the ground clearance of just three inches on this car, traveling that gravel road was really pounding on the car and on the occupants. But we made it. 
on November the 16th, 2010, we made it to Ushuaia, the southernmost city in the world. And the feeling that we had, I just cannot begin to describe it, was absolutely incredible. We felt so proud. And this area of water that you see behind you, that bit of water connects you to Antarctica. There is nothing left between this port and the southern continent. It is really a remarkable place. So what did we achieve with this project? Did we achieve our goals? Well, let's start with the kids. Did we inspire people to look at education differently with regards to science and technology? We firmly believe that we did. Thousands upon thousands of kids were completely awe-inspired, struck by how awesome this car is, and also how young we were. We were 22, 23 when we did this journey, when we built this car. Some of these kids here were 15, 16 years old. So they were just a few years away of being able to do things like this for themselves. And that really gave them the impetus to concentrate on their studies and concentrate on the right areas of their studies if they find science and technology interesting. But what about the adults, the decision makers, the people that actually buy cars and burn fossil fuels? Well, they were equally dumbstruck. They were absolutely thrilled to see that they could pull up at a traffic light next to our car and rev their engine as hard as they could and put their throttle down as far as it could go and be left in the dust of this electric car. And when they said, oh, what kind of engine have you got underneath there? We said, oh, it's electric. And they could not believe it that an electric car could outstrip any of their cars. And as you can see, no matter where we went, we were completely surrounded by thousands of people eager to learn more. So I started this talk by asking who of you would be interested in buying an electric car in the future? Who would be interested in this kind of technology? And I hope that with this little car and this very long journey, that next time more people of you would put your hands up. Thank you very much.